Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I want to talk about something I've been working on with uh, respect to the GS 5.4 and 5.5 experiments. Now, there's been a lot of talk about muons and mesons with the Holmlid paper and whilst we haven't got time of flight and all sorts of fancy equipment, uh, we did discuss some time ago about the use of this tool uh, which came out a couple of years ago and it's been developed a little bit further since and it's called DECO and it's Distributed Electronic Cosmic Ray Observatory and it's a tool for smartphones that allows you to see if you can find cosmic ray signatures uh, that might look something like this uh, once they're analysed on your smartphone Anyway, uh, the actual application looks a bit like this. In fact, it does look like this. And this is running on an old Galaxy Note 2. And it's got all kinds of data there. And you can see it's got one candidate count uh, in rather a lot of hours. Anyway, uh, this application isn't really suit suitable really for our needs. Uh, but a Russian guy saw that this uh, application had been developed and he thought he would uh, uh, develop his own for PCs called Cosmic Ray Finder. And it's a little app that runs on your uh, PC and it uses your webcam and it does basically the same thing, which I'll describe uh, in a little while. Uh, there is another big uh, project going on out there other than Deco. Uh, it's called Crayfish uh, at this address. And it says, the app that turns your phone into a cosmic ray detector, no joke. Join the first and only crowdsourced cosmic ray detector. You might just help discover something big. So this is called Crayfish, and you can sign up for the app. But um, I did, and I didn't really get it, uh, which is just as well that I discovered this Russian guy. Um... Anyway, so the guy's called uh, Alexey V. Voronin, um, and his website is foxylab.com. That's the address. And essentially, what you need is a webcam, and we've got one of these. It's a, a Logitech Tech, uh, HD C910 Pro. I think they're about $60 or something. Uh, uh, this is just the one we had here. It, it was our bubble cam from last year. Uh, we might need to replace the bubble cam. Um, and what I've done is I've covered it with card and tape. Uh, the idea is that you completely block out all incoming normal incident light, either sun or uh, incandescent or fluorescent or whatever. And then I've taken some of our check sources uh, because some people will say, well, this is just going to be sensitive to x-rays and all kinds of other things. Well, that it might be the case. So we thought we would uh, try it out because we can and you might not be able to. Uh, so we took a check source like this uh, and tapped uh, some sort of blue uh, painter's tape to it and uh, taped it on to where the window for the lens is. Uh, on the outside of that uh, mask. Uh, and that was one test we did uh, without any shielding, and then we did other tests uh, with shielding today, and this is a 1.8 millimeter piece of lead, and that's covering up the, the small source uh, in whatever source it is that we're testing. Uh, put a bit of blue tape on it, and then we ran these tests, and uh, you can see 30th of January 2017. These uh, radioactive isotope samples are from May 15th, uh, 2015, sorry, May 2015 and April 2015. So they've had a bit of time to decay. Uh, in the case of cesium-137, that doesn't change by too much, uh, but in some of the other sources, that that might do. So we used cobalt-60 uh, and. Uh, uh, without any shielding, we got eight counts after 30 minutes, and with some shielding after 20 minutes, we got four counts. Sodium 22, uh, 22 minutes, we got 12 counts, uh, and uh, with the lead, we got 22 minutes, we got five counts. And with the cesium 137 source, uh, we got 
uh, two counts uh, after 20 minutes and zero counts after 20, 20 minutes with the 1.8 millimeters of lead. Now, the highest energy here is the Cobalt 60, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. So that's all we have there. And so I will take you to the application, which is here, and it's quite nice uh, because uh, there we can see our Logitech HD, and we can see 2,592 by 1,944 pixels. It's doing about 304 samples per minute. It's been running for about eight hours uh, with no uh, check sources in front, and it's had no uh, registered events. And essentially what it's looking at is the RGBs uh, and we've got a, a limit here and when it exceeds 150 on any RGB uh, it says that as it triggers an event. It'll write a log file entry here and it will save the file to a, a predefined directory. So thank you very much uh, Alexei V. Voronin for this fantastic little gizmo. And uh, what I've been doing, and I've got this directory which you'll have access to uh, with the images, the various images, and I've take, taken the log files and you can see here there's the type of camera we used, the, the samples per minute it was doing when we were running that, that's because we weren't running uh, the Optris which you can see here is running uh, at the moment to test the data acquisition. Anyway. Uh, so we were getting more samples per minute uh, and our limit was set to 150 and our lead shields with this. So with nothing, we got two events in nine hours. So uh, these ones, quite interesting. Uh, we look at what our nothing is. And the first one, well, you really can't see anything going on in there. Doesn't help with the light here. But in the second one, there is something going on down here. Now I can actually zoom into that. There we go. And this is an event, so this is the only real event that we saw in nine hours. Uh, and it's interesting because when it, when it does actually log an event, uh, it actually gives you the RGB value here. RGB, RGB. Uh, so you know, you can maybe uh, have some software to find that specific pixel color uh, in the entire frame. Uh, uh, we haven't done that, but anyway. So then we put the Cobalt 60, which is a half-life of 5.27 years. So it's not even halfway through its life, even though it's uh, uh, May 2015 here, the manufacture date. But it has these two high energy gammas, or sort of fairly high energy gammas, 1.172 MeV and 1.333. And if we look at that, um, so the 60 cobalt for 30 minutes, we'll have a look at these. And it's not particularly spectacular, most of the images, to be fair. Uh, you might see something jump out of you. Oh, okay, so there's something down there. So we'll zoom into that, see what that is. So this is a, an event. Uh, uh, and we'll try and see if we've got anything else. There's one over there here. Uh, anything really that grabs me. This one's quite nice here. It's got a bit of shape to it. Okay, so that's the Cobalt uh, 60 and then the Sodium 22. Um, actually 12 events in a shorter period of time. Uh, but again, they're not very spectacular. Uh, so one of them, there we go. There's one back there that's maybe interesting. Okay, so up here. Okay, so you can see that not a lot of events, even with some fairly serious uh, uh, sources going on here. Um, and so you can see the, if we look here, the sodium 22 has got uh, a 511 kV. This is the uh, output we're looking for uh, for the positron uh, electron annihilation. Uh, uh, if, if we get the PN with the 18 oxygen, uh, that's the transition from 
18 fluorine back to 18 oxygen and it also has this uh, 1.275 MeV so you can see that's nearly as strong as, uh, as the 1.333 here in the cobalt 60 however the sodium it's, it, it's got more activity but it, it's still half of its half-life uh, having been April uh, 2015 because we're like getting into 2017 now aren't we so maybe approaching one half life or part of the way through that anyway uh, you see those uh, data points there anyway you, you, uh, you'll have access to all of these I'll, I'll put a link into the video uh, description of where you can download these I'll, I'll make it into a zip file um, and then you get sort of a less with the, the lead shielding in front. The cesium-137 only produced two uh, events and nothing with the the lead in the way, um, but it only has uh, the 0.662 MeV. And actually this is the uh, photon that we'll be looking for um, when we do the uh, Vysotsky uh, biological transportation experiments. This cesium-137 is 0.662. It's a very distinct signature. So um, that's, that's essentially it, and uh, uh, what we're saying maybe uh, is if we go back to our uh, nothing, um, if this is the only real signal we saw from nine hours of exposure, um, you know, if we see a lot of tracks, um, uh, then you know, maybe maybe something's going on in our reactor. And essentially what happens is uh, this saves it to a directory and we'll have the directory synced to uh, uh, the drive where all the data will go from the experiment. So you'll be able to see when we see, or even before we see, because you might be looking at it, um, whether we're having some <laughs> maybe muons or whatever else might be coming out of there, but you can see it's it's not overly sensitive. So if we see a lot of things... Yeah. Oh, I think it's just taken its first sample. Now, where did that go? Ooh. That little pop, that, that like a Geiger counter pop, is actually it taking a sample. Now, it's, it's actually saved that somewhere. Anyway, I'll have a look for that later. <laughs> So, yeah, these are some of the examples from um, the software developer Alex's own tests. You can see various tracks. He's saying that these are from 150 by 150 segments of his webcams detector, and then he's zoomed it three times to get these images. Uh, quite nice, but uh, the wonderful thing about this is you can download this app, okay, and you can get some, you know, black electrical tape, put it over the lens and you know you're good to go, you can start looking for cosmic rays and uh, if this works, you know, if this becomes a, a useful detector uh, it's some, almost something that's so cost effective that almost anyone can be running this with their experiments uh, rather than uh, you know doing without any kind of particle or photon detection. Anyway, thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.